it and let's continue. Uh, and we're not using it to do all sorts of secret stuff, but we're doing it for our uh, after movie and uh, uh, enabling us to make a nice wrap up this wrap up of this session. So uh, if you uh, uh, if you're okay with this, let's continue. The second house rule, uh, and let's keep it short, is that uh, if you join this, please switch on your camera and uh, switch to mute if you're not uh, contributing anything. And if you would like to ask a question, please do it using the Zoom interface and the question will come to Marije uh, and Marije will pose the question uh, towards me. So I'll include it in the discussion whenever I can. So uh, yeah, we encourage a lot of interactivity, but please do it using the chat functionality or raise your hand and we'll see if we can uh, merge it in. Um, my name is Wouter van Twillert and I'm the program manager of Circle at Skill. Um, a couple of you may have interacted with me before. I have a background in circular construction, also director of C creators. And what we try to do here is using the power of uh, innovation by the scale-ups, changing the system towards a more circular built environment. Today we have uh, a focused session. Um, and I'll I start with the welcome introduction. Uh, we proceed next towards uh, everybody's introduction, uh, and then I'll continue with what we're going to do here. So I'd first like to give uh, Marije the opportunity to introduce herself, and not only because I uh, like Marije a lot, but also because she's going to demonstrate on how we introduce herself to prevent us from, from spending too much time on it. So Marije, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I think you can put yourself on mute. Yeah, uh, it's a very difficult task, as you can see. I'm uh, Marije. Uh, I think I have met uh, most of you digitally. Um, I work for a German company and uh, I'm involved with Circular at Scale as well. And I'm responsible also for this uh, webinar. Um, and I'll pass it on to Barbara. Hi, everybody. I'm Barbara Oldebijfank. I work as a real estate developer for the campus of the TU Delft. And I'll pass it on to Martijn. Hi, I'm Martijn van Gameren. I'm an architect at Paul de Ruiter Architects, and I will uh, give a short presentation later on. And I pass it on to Rodrigo. I was with my, my Minecraft. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm in Brazil. So, I'm a PhD student in uh, industrial engineering and working on circular economy, actually, business models for a circular bioeconomy currently. And let me just see, pass it on to Mara. Is that Mara Nelder? That's me, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Mara. I'm part of the Circular at Scale team and the helping hand of Maria today. Um, thanks all for being here. And I'll pass it on to Alexander Hoymeyers. Hello, everybody. I'm Alexander Hoymeyers. I work at Martin Ceramics. Uh, we are a manufacturer of uh, Kerlock. Um, it's a circular facade system. I pass it on to Finn Havinga. Hello, my, my name is Finn Havinga. I'm a trainee at the European Investment Bank working with the procurement office there. Uh, I'll pass it on to Afra. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Afra. I work for Paba Meaning, and through Paba Meaning, I'm in helping Mariah and Mara with the Circular Skill Project. Um, and I'll pass it on to hmm, Stephen. Do we already have you? No, you didn't have me. Uh, I'm Stephen Otten. I'm uh, also an architect at Paul de Ruiter Architects. Um, and I will um, give a short presentation and talk on the Pampas Project, which is a, a, a UNESCO heritage project where we are fully circular and sustainable and have a very interesting um, approach on that. So um, I will pass it on to um, 
Birgitta, did we already have you? Hi, everyone. No, this is, well, this is Birgitta Kramer, um, and I am one of the funders of the Circular at Scale program. Uh, very happy to be here, and I'd like to pass it on to Florent. Thank you, Birgitta. Um, I'm Florent. <clears throat> I'm part of the Circular at Scale team as well, responsible for doing research on circular construction. Um, I'm also very happy to be here. And I pass it on to uh, Xander. Xander, we can't see you. Perhaps you're talking, but you're also not visible. Uh, let's go for... Noor. Yeah, Noor. Noor hasn't spoken yeah. yet. Yep, thank you. My name is Noor Haitema. I will, uh, I'm working at Cooperate as a consultant and I will give a presentation because I was also involved with the procurement of Pampus. Um, so that will be later on. And I will pass it on. I think there will be next. Is there, is everybody? Martin, I guess. Sorry for that one. Martin. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Martin Ingenhoes. Um, up until two weeks ago, I uh, was working for PZ Technologies. Uh, now I'm on a synthetic role. I'm exploring new uh, opportunities and I'm very much interested in circular building and uh, the supply chain challenges behind it. Your volume is quite soft, uh, Martin. So uh, maybe uh, I think you finished your introduction, but uh, for the next time you speak uh, a little bit louder. Um, sure, thanks. I see, I see Anik, uh, Anik Bielinga joined. Uh, are you able to turn on your microphone and uh, your camera? Yeah, I can do that. Hi, Wouter. <laughs> Short introduction of who you are and um, yeah, what you're doing. Yeah, so uh, I'm Anika, I'm the CEO of Scale Up Nation. And so we're partnering with uh, Powered by Meaning on this uh, circular at scale uh, uh, yeah, work stream projects, well, it's a program, shall we call it. Uh, and uh, so I'm really listening in also out of uh, curiosity for this uh, event. Yeah, thanks, Anik. Um, final call for Xander. I think he uh, went to get some tea in the meanwhile. Oh, he's there. Xander. Your microphone. Yeah. Oh, hello. Um, no, sorry, I was away. Um, I'm in and out today. Um, I'm Xander Cameron. I'm uh, the owner of Box Housing. Uh, and we try to build um, houses in a circular way. All right. Thanks for joining. Thank you. And I think we have uh, everyone who uh, was there at the moment. I saw some people coming in and, and leaving. So perhaps uh, they'll merge in, in a later moment. Uh, let's continue with uh, the program and um, yeah, how it fits in the rest of the uh, sessions that we organize through Circlet Skill. Uh, Circlet Skill is a quite a comprehensive program accelerator for Circlet Skill Apps and uh, and a business partner. Uh, as you can see, in four different work streams, we have the research work stream, the Skill Up Circular works in Circular Landmarks, and Circular Contracting. Uh, I think all of them are um, uh, are there today. So if we ask, if you have some more in depth question, please go to the people that are available. Uh, research as is represented by Florent. He's doing research on what are the uh, barriers, success factors of circular scale-ups in the circular construction and uh, steady progressing uh, to, towards a handbook of uh, uh, guiding principles, best practices, and how we can help them. Scale-up circular represented by Anik uh, is a program that uh, with the eight scale-ups that are participating, I'll show them uh, one slide further. Uh, Helping them to uh, do their to overcome all their growing pains, whether it's a sales problem, a delivery problem, uh, opening up a new factory, or a leadership team, or investing in a in a new uh, product. Everything has uh, uh, come up, and they have a, a plenary sessions and also individual booth sessions. Landmarks. Uh, we uh, we had two interesting landmark sessions from Aymere and Universiteit Utrecht helping uh, scale-ups and their business and uh, uh, construction clients to get to know each other, see how innovation could help them realize their targets. And today is circular contracting, uh, how uh, we can help 
suppliers, uh, commissioners, big companies uh, deal with the uh, yeah maybe the difficulties or the challenges that occur when you uh, not only want to do circular contracting but also circular contracting with uh, sometimes smaller scale-ups. Um, these are all the uh, introductory slides. Uh, let's go for a poll. Oh no, I see Cyril has joined the meeting. Cyril, could you maybe introduce yourself uh, shortly? Yes, sure. Uh, Cyril Heisters, a um, soft service specialist at uh, ASML. Um, so uh, that's me. <laughs> All right, welcome. Thanks for being here. Um, we have uh, come up with a poll to just get a feeling on how experienced you are with circular purchasing. Uh, Mara, what is your experience when it comes to circular purchasing? Absolute beginner, the theory, or we're doing it all the time? Yeah, I know the theory. I think Nora will say we're doing it all the time. Do we have some results yet? Yes. Ah, so there's some beginners here theory and we're doing it all the time. That must be Nor who says that. Um, next is, I'd like to introduce the participating scale-ups. Uh, we have, uh, and all our program partners, like uh, Birgitta already said in the beginning, Goldsmithing is the, uh, yes, uh, the founding partner that helped us set up this uh, this program. Uh, in a later stage, we managed to uh, include Invest in L and Innovation Quarter also as program sponsors. And uh, with this financial backing and also their network backing, we uh, included eight scale-ups in our program. As you can see them in the top, Spotter, Goodhart, Studio Slides, Move Builds, Vise, Modesta, Office Hub and Sustainer Homes. And we got to know all of them quite well the last uh, year, year and a half. Uh, I can imagine that you might be interested in getting to know them a little bit better. Please reach out to us and we can send you the details or look at our website, Circle at Scale. Uh, on the right bottom side, we see our sort of uh, yeah, program partners. We have Circle Economy who helped us uh, setting the stage and uh, also including their network uh, for us. I mentioned Amir and Utrecht University, and below we see Paul de Ruiter, uh, who we've been collaborating in both the, uh, or in the um, session with Utrecht University and also with this session. So uh, these are all the partners that we are working with at the moment. Let me go ahead to the speakers. How come it's not? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, first, I'd like to introduce Martijn van Gameren. Martijn has been working almost seven years at Paul de Ruyter Architects. Um, yeah. He will introduce the Paul de Ruyter vision on architecture and how they include bio-based materials before. Um, what I was most triggered about uh, when reading his uh, sort of LinkedIn profile or his biography was that he's fascinated about playing with Lego. Uh, so I'd like to know, Martijn, when was the last time you actually played with Lego? Well, the, the last time is, I think, two years ago. But to be honest, I was checking the website on Lego last night to see if they have some interesting new uh, <laughs> boxes available. So uh, you caught me red-handed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good to hear. Uh, Steven, uh, I also was checking out your biography, of course, uh, wanted to introduce you. You joined Paul de Ruyt, uh, I think, uh, about uh, a year ago or a little bit shorter, uh, a little bit sooner. Uh, I was triggered the most about the sentence, architecture is in your blood. Uh, could you maybe provide us a little bit more detail on how architecture is actually in your blood? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, first of all, I had this discussion with my uh, grandfather I, when I started being in a, like a, studying for architecture. My grandfather is not there anymore, but he was always very involved. And he said, yeah, our family has built a lot of, uh, of stuff uh, overseas. So I have a lot of family tradition in building. So that's literally in my blood. And also, um, and, and to be not literally, I, I think that I first wanted to be a doctor. 
and then I went to Africa and after four months of being a doctor, I was a bit fed up with, with it. And I started doing a project, uh, rebuilding houses there because well, the whole thing got mm -hmm. washed away. And there, like making hand bricks was more uh, my cup of tea. And um, that's where I started to think, hey, I want to be an architect and, uh, and so on and so on. So here I am. Yeah, and, uh, literally a very warm welcome Stephen and uh, you'll present the pompous case which is uh, in the image below you uh, after the break uh, thanks for being here and uh, looking forward to your presentation thanks uh, Noor I was also uh, diving into your details and of course I know you for quite a while already uh, one of the founders of Copper 8 with a background from TU Delft and uh, sort of out of a uh, eagerness to improve the system, you initiate corporates, and I think the first big project was the Alianda project. Um, it also said that you're a self-proclaimed optimist, uh, but I'd like to challenge you because being an optimist, do you think that we are moving fast enough in changing the service construction sector? If I just stay and look at my own bubble, I will definitely say yes, and if I step a little bit outside, I I do have a hard feeling, um, but yeah, I always look on the bright side and I see people moving. I see Corona having uh, some kind of improvements as well. So yeah, I'm always optimistic. So I think we're moving. It could, all, could always go faster and better, but yeah, things are moving, definitely. All right, thanks. And uh, looking forward to your presentation, which is actually starting right now. Uh, so we agreed that you'd share your own screen or would you like me to click ahead? No, we'll take it from here. All right, thanks, Gor. Uh, the floor is yours. Okay, great. Um, I cannot start the screen share. Okay, then I'll stop sharing, yep. and then I think you can. Great. And then I will have it right here. Um, yeah, thank you all for joining, and uh, thank you, Wouter, for the invitation to tell you something uh, about my passion, because I do love procurement, uh, especially when it comes to circularity and circularity in the building sector. Um, Wouter already introduced me a little bit, uh, so I will skip this, but um, civil engineer um, in Delft, over 70 years of experience in the building and construction industry. And the last 12 years, I was fascinated uh, by the circular economy, especially circular economy in the building and construction industry because I think we can really change something. Uh, and Wouter also told you that, uh, I think it's around eight and a half years ago that I was co-founded, I co-founded Copperate. And Copperate is a niche consulting firm and we only do projects in the circular economy. Um, and that's not only in the building and construction industry, but also in furniture, textiles or electronics, everything that we can think and feel that we need to change the system. So if you look at electronics and all the waste that's coming out and is going to China or other parties in the world, we think we need to change it. There's a lot of gold in there. That, yeah, it's not waste. So we need to change the mindset. And we think that from the purchasing power or procurement power, we can change the whole value chain. Uh, and we can see parties that normally are at the end of the chain are moving forward and are looking how we can we design stuff that we can make something out of it. So that's what we do. Um, we're also uh, author of two books on the circular economy. Uh, and we do a lot on e-learnings and publishing stuff to help people make or uh, at least uh, give them uh, yeah, some things to read on uh, the transition. And uh, we are uh, a consulting firm, but most of all, we are a B Corp and social enterprise. So we really believe uh, that impact first, uh, and we think we can change that, and that we do that by consultancy projects, um, but also we do have a think tank, um, and we really love to be researcher as well, and that could not be always uh, financed or uh, parties that want to pay for that, and we want to do it on our own way, so from the money that we uh, earn by the consultancy, uh, we finance most of all the, the think tank research we do. And after that, we also, besides that, we also participate in parties that are really uh, changing the system. So one of them is the Access Materials Exchange Platform, 
um, a dating site for secondary materials. Uh, so we use our mind and head and space to think how can we make the system change and how can we um, yeah, try to move things, things forward. Um, then a brief introduction. Uh, most of you are really familiar with it, but so uh, to, to put the procurement in place, um, we do have big changes ahead. And um, I think everybody knows that uh, population is growing um, and we do have something in a system that if um, we are in a company, we always need growth. And also from the economy uh, perspective, growth is the thing that we need to uh, rely on. And um, the problem is that for the growth and all the, the industrial uh, uh, things we need, uh, especially all the machines and, and products, I mean, everybody has a cell phone, uh, maybe even two, and you only use it for two years and then you get a new one because the software is outdated. Uh, and for all those machines and things, you need uh, the resources. So that's going pretty hard. Um, and from extracting all the resources, uh, also the pollution is growing. So we need to change something. And it's also that we do have exponential developments. So it's not that it's just getting a little bit warmer. It's getting a little bit warmer in an exponential way. So not only the, the exponential developments we need to face, but we also need exponential solutions. So not a little bit a plaster on a wound, but really take something that changes the beginning of uh, the problem. So from this exponential developments, we, we also, it's a little bit dark side maybe, but I will come up with a bright side as well. Um, the resource has grown massively over time. Um, and that's also, especially in the building and construction industry. So with all the people that are, yeah, the population that's growing, we need more houses, we need more industry, we need more and more and more. Uh, and we don't use everything that's already there. So this is uh, pretty impressive how many um, kilograms and, and tons we are using. And I think that uh, Marijn and Steven, or Martijn and Steven will, will come up to that as well. If we can reuse things, we can diminish this part. And um, I, mean, I think everybody has heard about it, but maybe you don't, but it's pretty inter interesting as well, the Earth Overshoot Day. So all the countries are mapped on uh, a scale on the, on the calendar um, to say what is the date that your company uses all the resources that can be regrown in a year. Um, so if you look at uh, the Netherlands, it's April 27 uh, in 21. So we just had it a little while ago. So there was already 27th of April that we used all the resources for the people that are living in the Netherlands that could be regrown in a year. So if everybody lived like a Dutch, we <laughs> needed more than three Earth to keep our consumer's perspective in place. And I think that's pretty impressive. Um, Qatar is, uh, is the winner of it all. I don't know, I think you can better say the loser of it all. Um, but I think we need to change the system. And the, part, uh, the bright part is that circularity can give us an approach of uh, um, uh, the way that we can change the system. And that's also because a lot of products that we use and reuse or that can be seen as waste, um, there's a lot of energy and CO2 emissions in there as well. So if we try to change the system and don't always uh, use new products and extract all the resources on a, uh, on a way that's not circular, then we can also have a very good uh, way to diminish the CO2 emissions. So the, for 45% of the products, we can have a, a good way to think how we can reuse them and change the system. And the way you can do that is to make and design products that you don't have to throw away when the software is outdated or, or there is a missing part. Uh, you need to think and produce uh, the products that you can have maintenance on. So if you look at a car, you can change a whole lot of stuff. 
uh, I think in the past it was even more. And uh, in this time, a lot of things are glued and, and on other ways, not even uh, replaceable. But we need to think, how can we make stuff that can last a long time by or doing maintenance? So this is the scheme that's from the Ella MacArthur Foundation. I think it's very interesting. On the left side, you see the green uh, circle and it's all the biological nutrients. So if you use wood in a building, then the uh, biggest challenge is not to use any kind of toxics uh, on the wood uh, to, if you take it out there. Maybe you can even bring it back to the woods and then it will grow some other stuff again. So make it really pure that if you use biological stuff, don't do any technical things with it or diminish the way uh, and then you can reuse it again as really natural ingredients. And on the right side, it's the technical nutrients, everything that we have made up by hand, by men. Um, and then the biggest challenge is that if you, you make the circles as small as possible, it's the best way to think in a circular uh, way and to work in a circular way. Because if you go further outside, then you bring the product back to the, from the materials to the nutrients. And if you have the nutrients, it's a recycle. Um, then you also have to add a lot of energy to go there. And if we don't have all the green energy for that, then we use the non-green energy. So that's not a good circle. So the main thing is uh, for this one is that if you use products, then really think of it. How can you have maintenance on that? And if you don't have maintenance, how can you take the stuff out of the product to use it in another product and all that way up to if you did if you cannot use the product anymore please think of how can you get the materials out of there to make a new product again and i think this is a very interesting technical way of looking at circularity as well it's the r letter from uh, uh, Jacqueline kramer um, and that's the way that you can think okay i want to use a product or design a product, um, what can you think of? And it's also from procurement perspective, the best thing you can do is the R0, refuse. And that's what we do with clients as well. Can we ask the question, okay, you want me to help you with procuring something, is it really necessary? Or is it maybe also uh, in, in a way that you can do it another way? Or Maybe you already have it, but it's not really updated anymore. So can we take something that you already have and put that in a procurement process to make it better? So the refuse part is the first thing that you need to ask yourself, do I really need it? And if I really need it, then you've got R1. And so it all goes downstairs. Rethink, rethink what you want to have. And is it possible to put it in another way or less way or, and then reduce. So it's really easy to make the steps uh, downwards. And um, yeah, the, the, the arrows on the right side is from high to low and innovation. So it's in technology, you need innovation, but also in product design or the revenue model. I think that's really interesting as well. Um, so you really need to think on all the R's, what can we do is it possible? Can I procure something and uh, ask the market to make it that I can repair it? Or maybe I can even ask the parties to repair it as well. I want to be uh, your supplier. You want to be my supplier for 15 years. Okay, I don't, only, I don't want to buy something. I want something that be, can be repaired as well. So really think about, okay, what do I need and what do I want? And um, from all the perspectives and all the things I just said, I think we all really focused on the technical part. So as a civil engineer, I really like to play with numbers. And I say, okay, can I measure technical uh, um, circularity? Is there reused materials in there? Uh, is there bio-based materials? And what's the amount of the materials? And yeah, I can say this is a pretty circular project or pretty circular product because da 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 da. Uh, but I think that if we really want to change from uh, a linear economy to a circular economy, we don't, uh, we not even, or we need only 
need to use technical uh, circularity, but it needs to be financial viable as well. So if the product is, is technically circular, then maybe there's also another revenue model needed, or I'm sure there will be another revenue model. Um, and also the, the cooperation between all the stacks in the chain need to be changed because sometimes they don't even talk to each other the party that is using the waste uh, with it, the one that's uh, making the, the, the product. So these are three um, rounds that get into each other. They all need to change to get from the straight linear thinking to a more circular thinking. So circular products can only be uh, marked as circular if you have another revenue model and maybe even other cooperation with parties that are using the stuff that you you are using or you did not use so they all need to change in a some way and then the power of procurement it is pretty big so we really thought we can change the system if we are focusing on procurement you can ask another question that's not only technical but also financial and maybe also uh, on the process way um, and yeah we do have and an enormous amount of money that's in Europe in the procurement. So we can really change something. And that's what we did. Uh, 10 years of experience in circular procurement. We bundled in a, in a book and um, uh, you can download it for free. Uh, and in this circular procurement, uh, we took out eight steps that can really help uh, everybody that is uh, in a procurement process or even not in a procurement, but just in a circular process to think about, okay, what do I need? Why do I need it? Um, is there some other uh, persons in, the, uh, in my organization that I have to align? Because normally maybe you only as a procurer coming in at the end of the, uh, of the process. And then, yeah, we need somebody that can procure the way we want to have it. And then you're done. And I think if you want to do it in a circular way, the procurement party needs to be, um, yeah, maybe the, the, the leader of the pack. Um, and also the financial party uh, person of your uh, company needs to change as well. So really think, okay, what's, what's the impact on the internal, internal organization to change the system? And from there on, it's about, okay, what question will I ask? If you look at the R's, uh, do I really need it? Do I need it another way? Is it just purchasing or is it also uh, for a longer term? And then you have the collaboration uh, with parties. Do you only want an architect or maybe you want a building team that's there for uh, as well for the building? So think about how can you really focus on uh, the expertise of parties that you want to combine? And from that's all internal, and then it goes to the external thing, the tendering procedure. Uh, you've got uh, some tendering procedures and we really love, and I think we always do it, is the dialogue in there. Uh, because everything that is put on paper uh, can be read uh, with different glasses. And I think the most important thing is that the parties that are going to work together really understand what the question is. So put a dialogue in the process always, just to make sure that the thing that's on paper is really well known and everybody understands what the meaning of the, the document is. And then uh, it's all about the measuring of circularity. Is there a possibility to measure it? Or is it just what's your vision on circularity and how can we manage it? What, what's the way? And I think 12 years ago, when we did our first circular procurement project, it was all about, okay, what do you think that the circular building could look like? Or what do you feel that's necessary? And then I think in, a, in the last 12 years, we already came up with some uh, indicators that you can yeah, really ask, okay, what's circularity about? And what's your score on that one or that one or that one? And step seven, securing circularity. That's the, yeah, sometimes the dry stuff. How do you put it in contracts? Um, and yeah, I think people can, especially uh, architects can have really real uh, castles to build when they make their uh, own projects. Um, and also when you're tendering, sometimes it's like, uh, yeah, air castles that's coming out. 
And the question is, okay, what if everything, the process is going on for two, three years to really start the building process, what's, what's in between there? Is it really the castle that's going to be built or is it just a tent? And how do you manage it? How can you organize that securing the circularity that's there in the tendering process all will be there in the project as well? And that will be in a contract as well. So all these eight steps are uh, in the book and can help you formulate your question and the way you think on circularity. Um, it's not totally different from a regular way of uh, purchasing, but there are some, some mind shifts in there. So I think it's really, uh, really interesting to have a look on that one. And it's also what I said already that circularity really requires a value chain effort. It's not only for clothing, circular clothing, uh, for example, it's not only the designer that you're, or the producer that you're uh, talking to, or you want to have a way of thinking. Uh, it's also all the steps and, and, and the chain that's behind there. Okay, what are they using? What kind of, of garnish? What kind of uh, clothing? What kind of uh, everything that's on there? So you really need to ask, okay, what do I get? And what is behind there for what I get? And what kind of parties do I need to be open with? And also another part is innovation is necessary for the circular transition. So also in the contract innovation, and that's a really harsh part because that's on legal stuff. And maybe normally they're not really fond of doing new stuff and be innovative. Um, but we have one project for a new road and there it was a framework agreement. So it's not only one procurement process, but it will be for a very long time with different projects in there. Uh, and that was hard for the legal department because they were very well known with their normal way of procurement and uh, the framework, but that was, uh, that was a cool one. Um, and also that we had one, the fair meter, it was a pilot. And normally pilots are, um, yeah, not all, always paid for all the parties. And here it was. So we thought about, okay, how can we really change the system and make everybody transparent on what they do, what they want to do and what the results are. Um, so think about how can we change the system and make the financial part um, a factor that, that does change the system. Um, circular procurement is possible in all sectors. Uh, we really love to do it in sectors that, that, are, that need to change uh, and didn't change that much. So in the building and construction industry, we do have a lot of work to do, uh, but we also did that for uh, clothing. Uh, we also did it for furniture and for roads. Uh, so there is a really broad part of uh, disciplines that can be changed and uh, needs to be done. So that's really cool. And then some tips for everybody that's going to do something with circular procurement. <clears throat> Yeah, maybe it, it, it sounds strange. I will be um, always working in there for 12 years, but we are at the start. Uh, so we need a lot of experimenting. And sometimes the experiment doesn't look of, goes well, but we do learn a lot of it. Just So just start it and do it. Um, and I think another one is also my optimistic uh, glasses uh, that failures do not exist. Um, there will always, there's always something coming out of there and we do learn a lot of it. So just start and do it. And also look for enthusiastic um, colleagues or partners to join, because sometimes it's really hard to change yourself, the way you look, uh, the way you speak to other parties that say, nah, it's not possible. Uh, so I think that in this whole group, you will have some colleagues and, uh, and partners that you can call and say, okay, I'm a little bit, depressed or pessimistic can you please help me come up with but because we can if we just uh, support each other so organize time and support uh, circular procurement takes more time at the start because things need to be changed and normally that they, takes time but i can definitely say it will deliver more contact not only with colleagues but also with partners uh, that you thought that were maybe uh, yeah enemies uh, but they will be partners. Um, it will deliver understanding, impact, and especially joy. So um, yeah, just do it and start with uh, using your wallet to change the system. 
Thanks, Noor. That's a very inspirational and motivational uh, end of your uh, presentation. Um, I have a couple of uh, questions which I think might better fit uh, after the break, uh, but I'd like to trigger you before so that you have some time to think and then we can uh, start with them uh, as soon as uh, both Martijn and Steven have uh, delivered their presentation. So the first one is um, what could be the um, yeah, the biggest hurdle or the most significant barrier to prevent certain procurement, specifically in the construction center uh, sector, for, of taking place. So uh, please do not answer yet, uh, because I see you are already uh, <laughs> uh, dying to start. Um, the second one is a question from uh, Birgitta, uh, and it goes back to the uh, eight-step approach. Um, uh, in step three, you uh, have to take time to define the question, and in step six, you take time to define what is a measure of success. Uh, aren't these tips, two steps very much interrelated, uh, or are they different? Do I did I understand your question correctly, Birgitta? All right, she's not, so uh, that's another one. And uh, a question that popped up in my mind is um, what I've noticed the last couple of years in the construction sector is that the split incentive is a very strong uh, barrier in the construction sector. And uh, not everybody might understand what the split incentive is. So perhaps you could start with uh, explaining what the split incentive is, otherwise I will. Uh, and then we can uh, focus on what your thoughts are on that, on how we can prevent it. All right, thanks, Norla. I hope you're triggered and uh, you have time to uh, prepare some answers. Next, I'd like to introduce Martijn. Uh, I think you can also share your own screen. And uh, yeah, uh, please take us away in the vision or the ambition that Palderet Architect has on circular, uh, circularity in the built environment. Yes, thank you, Walter. Um, share my screen. I was told to really uh, keep the time in mind because <laughs> I tend to uh, elaborate uh, a lot because I'm so super enthusiastic about the sustainable design. So I try to uh, keep it short and simple. I hope everybody can see my screen. Hi, I'm Martijn. I'm from Paul de Ruyter Architects. We're an Amsterdam-based uh, architecture firm where we see the building as an energy source. This is our office. We uh, started here in 2007. Uh, Paul started the office in 1994. And we have a sustainable driven design and we do that with this beautiful sustainability donut which we use a lot um, all the buildings we design are for people we should never forget that uh, that the buildings we, we make are for us for the people um, but like nor said we the environment is changing so we have to take care of our resources so we do that with the energy, we do that with materials, and we do that with ecology. Today, I want to show you two uh, uh, study cases we built, um, which go for energy and for material usage. And I will start with the QO Hotel in Amsterdam. It's a building on the right. It's a hotel um, uh, which we the construction started in 2014. So already seven years ago. The, our first question was, please, can you make a design for, uh, for a hotel for us? Um, that's nice, but we like to think different about stuff. So if you take a look at the design for a hotel or the use of a hotel, you only use it for eight hours and that's during the night. And during the day, the hotel will, the hotel room will start to heat up. Um, and then if you come back into your room, you put your card in, in it, uh, the, vent the ventilator will start blowing and it will get very cold and it uses a lot of energy. And we thought this should be done different. So we have performance-based design where we take a look at the total cost of ownership. We wanted to downscale the energy footprint using the Trios Energetica. So we had a very small uh, footprint and we had a big facade with a lot of hotel rooms and we thought, how can we lower the energy footprint without uh, putting it full with PV panels? Because I think 
that's the last step you should take. First, try and solve everything with the, the architecture itself instead of active systems. Um, and I will show you a little video on how we did this because we actually took a look at all the hotel rooms uh, as a as a primary unit uh, which should solve its energy source itself. So if you would enter the lobby downstairs, the card will activate your hotel room and your facade opens. If you clock out uh, by removing the key card and going into the hallway, the facade closes. This way, the whole building transforms during the day like a chameleon uh, acting and reacting on the sun and on its surroundings. So it's in that way, the use of energy is like very little because you, you have an uh, actual extra facade in front of your normal facade. Um, but it's not only about the use of energy, it's also about the use of materials. So we use and reuse a lot of materials locally. Uh, on the left, you see the Adam Tower. It's um, uh, redesigned. Uh, there was a refurbishment a while ago, and the whole facade was taken off, uh, put into the shredder, and we made the uh, whole concrete uh, construction out of it. And it was shipped within Amsterdam. So it so also the footprint of where the materials came from was very low. So think about where can you get your materials from? Where do you get your energy from? Because if you have less waste, and you can uh, minimize all the movement on your building site and on your um, uh, during your construction phase, you have a way more sustainable and even a circular uh, way of building. So the picture here are all the hotel rooms of the QO hotel on pallets, and they would arrive, go, uh, were put with a crane into the correct floor, and then someone would finish them all off. So pre this was prefab building like uh, like seven years ago, which we'll I get back to later on. Because if you can use your materials in a smart way, you get a very adaptive and a flexible building which you can reuse over time. This is the Biosyntum. It's a more recent pro uh, project from 2017. Um, the, the, when it started, it was finished in 2019, and it's made with more than 80% of bio-based materials. This is the uh, interior of the, of, the, of the central heart. So it's a, uh, the Biosyntum was a building for um, the bio, made for the bio-based economy. So offices which are into uh, the bio-based economy could settle here. And there's also education here. So the building itself should um, breathe this, uh, this bio-based economy as well. So we use more than 80% of uh, bio-based materials, which were from renewable sources. They have a very low environmental impact and they were non-toxic. We, because we already knew this in a very in the beginning of the um, of the design process, we were able to um, anticipate on this in a very brief or a very um, uh, like very from the start of, of the time of the of the project. So we can involve a lot of suppliers, um, contractors, constructors, all locally, which were in the end involved in this project and participated and, and, and we even grew our own uh, hand up and our own uh, grass which was used in the flooring. So by gathering materials locally but also through crowdfunding, you see some uh, genes which were uh, we, in the municipality where, where this was built, it was in, in Friesland, um, in the northeast of the, of the Netherlands. We had some boxes through the whole municipality where people could hand in their jeans and later on they were shredded and were put into uh, the building itself. So also I uh, added, threw in uh, two pair of my jeans 
uh, not on this picture, but <laughs> they are somewhere there. Um, but by gathering materials through crowdfunding and also uh, locally, you get a very good platform, or at least a, um, I would say this like you 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 gain trust of the uh, and support from the people surrounding and supporting this project. So everybody is if everybody is chipping in, people want to make a better project and product. It's like Noor said, is it all about the architect who, make, who makes an uh, air castle or is it about the building team where you work together and create a pro project product? So I think the future is, this is where we are at now. We are now working with modular building systems where we define the circular building through the life cycle by the Seward brand model. Um, it's still in our R&D department, so uh, it's very, uh, yeah, real, as we say in Dutch. Um, but for us, this is the next step, because if we combine our knowledge from the prefab um, method we use in the QO hotel, together with the bio-based material um, systems we use in the bio syndrome, we think we can change the way we build houses and build um a better future for us and everyone but by that we need to go from ego to ego so it's not about the only about the architect it's not only about the developer it's about everyone and everyone around us it's about the environment so you need to design by creating energy and adding biodiversity we need to design with only what's necessary and what's there so together we can build an inclusive, affordable and healthy environment. I think it's even in between the, so between the time. Um, so Stephen will talk next about our fourth island pompous in which we have a very uh, circular uh, way of thinking in all different phases as well. So um, for us, that's a benchmark for circular redevelopment, which we talk on after the break. Yeah, thanks, uh, Martijn. And uh, before we go to a small uh, break, uh, I have some questions which sort of popped into my mind uh, uh, preparing for the session and also uh, by your uh, conversation. Um, three things, actually. Um, how do you see the role of the architect within circular procurement? Uh, and maybe we can also sort of go into that uh, question uh, later during the uh, interaction together with Noor and uh, Steven. Uh, because I can imagine that it's sometimes quite reactive uh, when you feel that you might be a little bit more proactive. So that's an interesting thing, I think. The other one is uh, it's also based on a question that we received uh, up front is uh, how can you ensure that circular procurement uh, doesn't make it a lot more expensive? And especially now in a time when a lot of the building materials are, uh, the price of the building materials are uh, rising uh, and uh, you hear a lot of uh, people complaining, okay, uh, especially wood construction is becoming a lot more expensive. And uh, how do you deal with that in certain procurement? And the third question is uh, triggered by an article in the Volkskrant, I think yesterday, day before yesterday. It says that architects are uh, not really excited about the uh, future of a lot of industrialized construction. And I think this is particularly the case in uh, housing, uh, but it might also be uh, more relevant for uh, yeah, the, the type of objects that you normally uh, create. So I'd like you to think about it and then uh, we can uh, go into a little bit more detail after uh, Stephen's presentation. But uh, thanks for your presentation. Let's have a five minute break and then we'll uh, rejoin at one past four on the dot.
And Noor, can I ask you something? The next okay. slides are about the uh, procurement of copper aid, I think, in the whole presentation. Isn't it, um, is it uh, that, that this is like introduced by copper aid? I can also introduce it, but the next part is actually more. Yeah, so that. I start with the procurement process and then you take it over? That's perfect. Yeah. Okay, cool. We have to tell Wouter, so it'll be all right. Perfect. I heard it, I heard it. Cool. He's always there, listening. Always listening. Always yeah. listening. All right, I think it's um, it's the one past four, so let's uh, let's continue, and uh, people will uh, will join whenever they are ready. Um, yeah, like uh, Stephen and Nora already discussed, uh, let's uh, uh, proceed to the next part of the uh, of the presentation uh, centered about the Pampas Island and the Pampas project. Um, Nora, could you maybe start with the circular procurement of uh, Pampas Island? <laughs> and uh, Stephen will, will uh, continue afterwards. Yep, I'll do. I did prepare some slides for that, so um, very short, so. And there they are. Do you see it? Yep. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, we were involved um, uh, by Pampas for the architect selection. Um, uh, Martijn and Steven will tell you more about the Pampas Island. So I will leave that part. And they have really nice pictures and uh, things. So that's not my cup of tea. Um, the, pro the process for the architect selection, it was not a European selection or anything that, like that. So it was just um, uh, what we did is we approached some architects um, for an ambitious heritage object. We didn't use uh, the name of the project because we didn't want to have architects that were fond of the name but didn't really want to do the project. So we did it anonymously. And uh, we called uh, architects in around uh, Amsterdam and uh, Muiden um, to have a little chat with them and to see if they are interested in doing a project for uh, heritage. And um, uh, there were, uh, after those uh, talks, we had seven architects selected uh, to have a coffee talk with uh, at the office, also with the, the people from Pampas. Uh, to have a talk with them on how do you see the project. We did tell them that it was pompous and we did tell, the, to tell them some uh, more specifications on the project um, to see, okay, how do you like it? What's your first reaction? What do you think is possible for this uh, project? And um, we did it with three people from pompous and we had a, a metrics made uh, to see, okay, if we have this conversation, with seven architects, we need to choose two of them to have the next round. Uh, so on different criteria, they were um, scored to see with, what were the architects. And we had a really nice discussion on that one to see, OK, who is going to be the two uh, parties that were going to the last round. And the last round was a session with the two remaining architects uh, on site. Well, no, it was not on site of Pampas, but on their own uh, location. So one time we went to the south of Holland and the other time we went to Paul de Ruiter. And the agenda was uh, fully uh, in the hand of the architects to let uh, Pampas see, okay, what is your vision on the project? What do you think about it? What's your uh, reaction? Or what, what do you think we can make out of it? Um, and that was when Paul de Ruiter came up to win the project. There was consensus on uh, the winner. And um, yeah, Paul de Ruiter was chosen to uh, make the uh, design. And the procurement process was um, award determined based on the creativity of the architect. So this was the list of uh, criteria for the last two architects. It was all about the creativity they had, the integrity, um, also the concreteness. So is it really like the castle or uh, the air castle or is it really like, okay, we can think about the way you should do this or what's your uh, focus. Um, also it was a qualitative, 
qualitative aspect, the click and collaboration. So it was not hard. They couldn't say, okay, uh, I will give you, uh, I, I can determine that your click is six or seven or eight. It was the dialogue afterwards uh, with the three people from Pampas. What, what was the feeling? Did we get a good feeling? Was it okay? Was it better by that architect or without that architect? Um, we also gave them new information during the three hours uh, to see how do they respond and react on uh, different kind of uh, yeah, involvements or uh, things that are happening and changing. Uh, so it was like a little bit like a role game uh, to see does it really click. Um, also, the question was, what will be the risk that you see? And do you see any control measures? Do you have any experience with it? Um, and uh, yeah, the, the, one of the last pretty interesting thing is that Pampas doesn't have a lot of money. Uh, it's heritage. And um, uh, so it was also a question to the architects, do you see or do you have a network with parties that can maybe also have some financial uh, possibilities? Uh, it was not the most important part, uh, but we did ask the question to see, okay, can you change your way of thinking? Can you, can you uh, see how we are uh, yeah, changing the system and look on the bright side? And um, there was also available budget. So there was not the highest amount. So it was also the question, how can you manage with that one? And with Paul Reiter, um, the next step when they were selected, and Martijn and Steven will uh, give you more information, that one was also, first of all, a scenario study. So there was no, um, uh, nothing yet there. So it was really how many scenarios, what can be the scenarios, what will be the project, all that kind of stuff. And from that side, it went to the sketch design um, with also other parties involved. And at the moment, um, well, it, 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 it was a little bit still uh, some time because uh, the, the biggest part was to get finance. Uh, for the whole product that is going the right way at the moment. So um, at the moment, they're continuing the design process and Stephen can take it out from here, I think. You need to go off mute, Stephen. Yes. We have lift off. All right, thanks. Um, what I will do is I will uh, share my screen uh, for higher quality picture. But first of all, yeah. Also, why did we get the the Pampas project? Yeah, you, it was a like a like a, a, a good selection and also a good selection criteria. That this wasn't the standard tender situation where you have to present this beautiful plan and you will win on these images. And, uh, and we continue, but it was more also uh, in cooperation and, um, and also in dialogue with the parties. So I called uh, Tom and René this week and said, yeah, why did we win? It's like two years ago. I said, yeah, most of all, it was your sense of entrepreneurship and also to really want to achieve these ambition, ambitions. So get the job done in cooperation with, of course, our values as a Paul de Ruyter architect to, to really be a um, front runner in sustainable and circular uh, building. So I think that being entre an entrepreneur is also tr really trying also to, do the, to have the risky stuff and going for that is also why we won. And uh, next to, of course, having a, a vision and a plan. What I will do is I will explain a bit about Pampas and not only about the beautiful pictures, but more about the circular and sustainable uh, systems that's behind this project. Let me share my screen. System preferences are oh, nice. Okay. Mac is in uh, a bit of a fight with my uh, zoom so maybe nor can you share and then you can click through it's the same presentation i use my own presentation so martin do you have it uh, right there? 
I, I have it. I'll share. Thank you. Classic. This is why we have backup. Huh? That's why we have backup. Um, but then I need to do something. Yep. Share screen. Thank you. There you go. All right. So the island of Pampas. It's um, it's a uh, near uh, Amsterdam, in, in uh, next to Meiden, in this in the Eimeer. And um, let me first to understand what we did. Let's first go to the history of this island because it's as interesting um, as its future. Um, because it's it's a cornerstone in the defense line of the Amsterdam. Uh, uh, line of defense in the 19th century. So we built this this huge um, succession of ports and uh, and defenses uh, around Amsterdam, which uh, this one is actually a cornerstone, one of the end pieces of this defense line in the sea. And um, yeah, it's uh, why is this so interesting? Because during uh, uh, the war, during a war, this island would have been shut down from the land. And it should, uh, it should support then 200 soldiers, fully sustain itself, because yeah, you got shut down from the uh, land and you had to protect, protect it. So making this island self-sufficient and sustainable in a way is, um, well, it's actually a strong continuation of its own history. And I think that uh, making the fort ready for the next uh, 24 or 125 uh, years to come uh, is uh, is one of the challenges. Also, um, looking back in history, it's a nice succession of of what it is as a fort and an island itself. So I think uh, in that sense, Pampas uh, is also a UNESCO heritage, and this can be seen as a showcase um, how to transform and redevelop in a sustainable way. Also, this kind of heritage. And if you go to the new uh, to the next slide. So what we did is we, we want to make this island fully sustainable and sustain itself in a, in a few ways. But also we want to make it um, so that Pampas will have uh, um, ways in um, giving the visitor a better experience of the heritage itself. So what you can see here is there's an entrance pavilion dug into the earth and you have uh, energy systems next to it which support this um, this uh, whole island so if you break it down you can go to the next slide we have to bring a few core uh, values towards it first of all is the heritage how do you deal with an uh, with a fort itself and how do you respect it so i will show you in a few slides now there's a big pavilion on top of it and it blocks the fort. And what we do is we dig in this, uh, this new entrance pavilion, like a militaristic way, looking over the water, but actually not blocking the fort itself. That's something I think is, in, in an architecture sense, important to, uh, to make a link to history and also to historic purely in an architectural sense. And if you go to the next slide, there were four core values in this plan, which are important and also why we won, is the four E's, well, in, in, in Dutch it's four E's, in English it says one H, but I will call the four uh, E's, which is Erfgoed, Heritage, Exploitation, Education, and the energy, energy Transition. Those four core values are brought together. So it's not only being like what Martijn said, a technical solution, but it's more than it. You have to respect heritage, but you have to be able to get energy, uh, uh, your energy demand, your energy consumption. You have to match that. But also the island has to work. So you have to make money. So the exploitation is as important to be sustainable. And you want to, uh, and also what Pampas think is very important is to educate their visitors about the um, core values of a sustainable way of living. I think those four core values we had to protect. Um, and that's an extreme integral design approach, I think. And that's also the biggest challenge. Um, how did we do it? So if you go to the next slide, 
you have the way how you deal with ecology on the island. So strengthening biodiversity, but also having food production on the island. The aim is to have 40% of the food production on the island itself, which is used in the restaurant. Then we have water use, smart water use, water saving, but also we are purification, all the water on the site itself. So we, we ban bottled drinks, we ban bringing water to the site. We wanna have it all uh, within technical installation. We wanna be fully uh, self-sufficient on water. And we, that's why we have, for instance, also rainwater collection. Then on energy, we want to have no fossil fuel combustions. So, that means we have to get our energy from, for instance, PV cells. But what Martijn also said, first you look at the passive way of doing it. So for instance, air conditioning, we don't have energy for that. It takes too much energy. Even if you like put the whole island full of PV cells, it's, uh, it's impossible. So we dig in the pavilion to sort of stop it from overheating. And then we make a cap, for instance, to uh, not bring in all the sun. Those are the first steps you do. And then you bring the technical things in like uh, PV cells. And uh, we try to get energy from, for, for instance, uh, hydrogen cells, et cetera, et cetera. So the last thing is we use uh, bio-based materials and we uh, want to make them all demountable and minimizing use of materials and also minimizing waste. If we continue. So first of all, before you start designing, you have to make these schemes. How do you bring in energy? And also how do you use energy? And uh, I'm not gonna explain this whole uh, scheme, but I think the most important thing is that we think differently about how we use energy. So not we need uh, four coffee machines, we need air conditioning and it takes so much energy, but we ask our questions, do we need air conditioning or do we always need to have coffee. So when, uh, when the kitchen is operat operational and you have a low level en energy, maybe you can't have coffee. And you accept that as a user and you accept it as, uh, as, um, as your restaurant. And then it's completely different a way around thinking like that. Um, so I think it's first of all a human thing to not expect always to have energy or, uh, and then to deal with that. If you go to the next uh, slide, also with water, we have to be uh, very careful with our water use. So there's a whole chain of, uh, of uh, systems that uh, make sure that water collection and purification is, uh, yeah, is, uh, is up to date and it's, you, you use as less as you can. You can uh, continue. And then last but not least is how do you use materials? Uh, and I think to go into your question, is it always more expensive to make a circular building or use bio-based materials? I can already give a little uh, insight. We had this budgeting issues in the project always. So we're now we're in the VO design. We're going to the next phase and my, um, my, um, uh, advisor on uh, finance said we were too expensive, of course, because price went up the last year. It's ridiculous in the building industry how prices will go up. So we, we actually start thinking way differently. So how can we reduce material and make it a stronger concept? So we looked at the, for instance, the flooring. I said, we, do, we need, do we need a floor? Yeah, or else the water will go in and all the groundwater and all the water from the Aymir said, why don't we use the, why don't we divert the water next to it? It will, with a gra uh, gravel level, a gra gravel layer, it will flow underneath the building and then we can have sand and a, and a street, like a, uh, uh, and we can have uh, stones. Then we don't need an expensive floor and we don't need an expensive concrete basin. So it kind of made the project viable again because we, we skipped some unnecessary stuff, which at first you think it's impossible to do, to make a, a watertight concrete basin is first of all, not so circular and, and concrete is the worst uh, in, uh, in material you can actually uh, 
use in, uh, in this kind of uh, way, even bringing this material to the island is a problem. So thinking differently made also the project more financially viable. So that's an interesting thing I also got to learn as an architect. All right, next uh, slide. And the last but not least, we are on an island. So everything you have there, so the existing pavilion, you think about reusing because you have to bring all the materials to the island and all the waste you have to bring away from the island. It's, it's, uh, the island makes even more important to think about like what do we have there and what can we reuse. So what we're now doing is we're making studies how to reuse the existing pavilions and bring it all to the new pavilion. Of course, you can do all, but our, uh, we have set a goal to use everything that is there and have no waste going from the island to the shores. And that's, uh, of course, uh, a very interesting way of thinking about reuse of what you have on this island. Next slide, please. So you have to have uh, parties involved, also in your procurement, that have the same ambitions. It's not really standard to do this kind of thinking about circularity and sustainability. So what we're doing is we're bringing together these partners, for instance, uh, Antea Group and Paul de Ruyt and Pampus. We are uh, uh, working together with some installation and uh, uh, advisors on how to deal with this, yeah, these challenges. But also we have a constructor which is involved as an assistant professor at the TU Eindhoven. And there is a student at the uh, VU Amsterdam who's investigating the environmental impact of reusing the existing pavilion. So we're also trying to scientifically uh, test if what we're thinking actually works. Sometimes you have a beautiful plan about reusing a pavilion, but it's all nailed together. It's not circular. So is it, is it, uh, uh, as, um, uh, is it as uh, circular or as a, uh, is it a good way of thinking? You can also investigate that. So we try to bring scientific and practical things together. And you have to have parties who are willing to think circular. So for instance, the port of Amsterdam is involved in material mining. We have steel plating. Well, how do we get steel plating? You can get them new, but you can also try to find them and, and mine them. Next to our side is the port of Amsterdam. So let's bring in steel plates that are laying there and reuse them. Also thinking about glass, do we need new glass or can we reuse glass? It's still in a pilot project. So getting all this glass separated from each other, cleaning it from a different project and bring it into a new glass panel is uh, actually way better than like just breaking the glass and trying to make new glass. So in that sense, contracting ambitious co-partner in combination with scientific verification is very important in the process and in your procurement. I think getting this, for instance, the builder, getting it in early in the process, also having uh, his say and also bringing his experience in is super important to get done your beautiful ideas towards the practical side of it. Um, so that's about it. If you go to the end, you see the end result and uh, we're working towards um, yeah, we're going to go now in the next phase, which is more technical. So really solving all the, uh, all the ideas we have. Um, but yeah, I can talk about it for hours and let's keep it a bit uh, uh, on the, also on the procurement side. Um, and I'm uh, wondering, uh, let's, let's have a nice discussion about this also, how, uh, how we can, um, how we can uh, bring a process uh, and people together with ambitions and also making it work. Um, Thanks, uh, Steven, for your uh, presentation and uh, really nice to see how the Pampus project is uh, processing or, or, or what you said, proceeding, I mean. Um, and um, yeah, I've, I've been at the Pampus Island a couple of times now already and it's always an inspiring place to uh, go there already. Uh, and I think after the project has been done and it's even uh, even more beautiful to uh, to go there uh, a couple of questions popped into my mind um, and also maybe related to the question that i previously asked martijn the role of the architect in circular procurement um, 
I noticed that you are very much involved in um, in the actual sort of uh, refusing specific uh, structures or things uh, of them not being there. Is, is that one of the main roles that you see for yourself, uh, ensuring that there's less material use or ensuring that you stay within the budget or stay with even within your envir environmental footprint? Well, I can uh, I can elaborate on that. Um, yeah, of course we are we are uh, trying to have more influence in uh, which materials you use and which you actually can't use, but also which parties are involved. We try to bring them in in the like in the beginning of the process. You try to bring in parties which actually can deliver a circular way of building, or they know how to deal with their waste, or. And in that sense, it's different than a traditional role of architects where in the end, there's a contractor and they have their parties. And then, yeah, as an architect, yeah, you say, okay, um, I might not like it, but yeah, your influence is, is not so big, especially when it comes to money. Um, I had this discussion with Martijn this uh, afternoon in the car. What is our influence? Of course, we try to have the influence. And I think the key to that is bring the contractor in very early and, and find contractors who have the same ambition and have the same qualities um, of the rest of the team. So it's not only money driven, it's also uh, based on uh, the skill set of a contractor and their will to be circular. Yeah, I understand, but I'm also sort of referring back to what Nor previously uh, showed the picture of the different strategies that you can, uh, the R letter. And I think an architect, and something that sort of resonates to me right now, uh, can play a very important uh, role in refusing to build stuff. And I think uh, by refusing to build stuff, you uh, create extra space in your budget to uh, let the other be, uh, stuff be even more circular or potentially a little bit more expensive because you, you gain some, uh, some space. Yeah, I, I totally agree about that. I think as an architect, you're the catalyst in the whole uh, uh, process and, uh, and design to make, like, like you say, you can, if we can refuse, that's like the best there is. But unfortunately, there are uh, also architects who don't refuse. Um, so that's that's also where the procurement comes in eh? to, ma to make sure that that everybody um, make sure that um, that we refuse or can, or should refuse yeah nor could you um, share your thoughts on this topic the role of the architect yeah especially yeah yeah i think it will be a circular project they will have a, a, a much bigger role than in the linear projects because um you don't know exactly what the materials will be on the right moment in the right time available. So you need to be flexible and um, the parties that are going to use the materials need to have the right mindset. Um, so I think it's, it's yeah, the red line uh, will be again with the architect that has been there a long time ago is coming back again to, um, I think in the early days, an architect was a building master. Uh, and I think that will come back again. That's true. I think it, it's not a traditional building mass. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you that we have to have the, the all the skill set as an architect to really know everything about building and also about um, being progressive in uh, circular building. But sometimes you have to also um, step up and have a client which is as ambitious as you. So I think as a, you can be an ambitious architect, but you also need most efficient clients. I think that role is super important. Yeah, uh, and I'd like to sort of uh, uh, build on that topic as well, uh, because um, the Pampas project is a project where there's a serious budget squeeze. Um, is that also uh, sort of, if you did it at Pampas, 
you can do it everywhere. Is that uh, is that the situation that occurred? Because I I also know the the, the circle project at uh, Pavilion by Abin Amro. Uh, it's always highlighted as an iconic circular landmark, and it is. But the problem is that they had maybe twice the budget that a normal uh, uh, builder has. Uh, so I'm looking at Pampus, and I see okay, they have limited budget. They have no way to uh, remove the stuff of the of the island, or at least it's uh, it's uh, cost intensive. Can we say after the realization of Pampus that if we did it at Pampus, we can do it everywhere? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. think I think actually because you also say circle, and we of course have the biosyntheme, etc. I think the biggest change should be in housing projects and large scale housing projects. Um, I think there is a lot to gain. And okay, okay. Uh, and re refer and I back will, to- I will add to that one. Uh, no, I don't think that if you can do it at Pompas, you can do it everywhere. Uh, if it's a pavilion, because it's all about the client. And I think that Tom from Pompas, the director uh, is really well-minded. Uh, and he can say, okay, we can refuse things or we can just do it another way because I think that is best. And then you can make, the, yeah, the, the big circular change. But if you have a pavilion somewhere else and you have a client that says, okay, it's my mind that you need to make, or you have, okay, you have done pompous, but I want it another way. Then it's no, yeah, you start all over again. So it's all about the, the mindset of the client, I think. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, I need the same, maybe we should have the same team of uh, Tom doing all projects in the Netherlands and the world. And then, uh, But that's true. But I think the modus operandi, think how you rethink building, if you, if you have that sort of system, systemic change, it will have a big impl impact on, uh, on building. Um, but yeah, it's a small scale, a very niche project. I think how to deal with heritage projects I think it can be an example because uh, it's uh, it's that unique. Uh, if we can do it in Pampas, you can have circular and sustainable development at U at UNESCO sites, or you can have it everywhere. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. Um, I previously posed a question to Martijn about uh, how architects. Uh, Walter, uh, Jasper, Jasper is waving uh, sometimes as well. I don't know if you want to give him some floor, but. Uh... Um, Sorry about that one. Yeah, yeah, I'll I'll, uh, I'll uh, tap into him. I'll uh, <laughs> I'll give him the the word later on. Um, Martijn, we previously discussed um, the vision of architects on industrialized housing, and you mentioned housing yourself. Um, I'm not saying Paul de Ruyter is an architect like any other architects, but do you uh, agree with the uh, the article meant in Volkskrant? I, did, I didn't read the article. Um, I do know uh, that we need, well, for me, I think we need to make a change in affordable uh, housing. And I think that the role of circularity and of the architect should be more key in that. Yeah, because I think maybe I'll, I'll summarize it in two sentences. It's uh, so we need to build one million houses in uh, in the Netherlands in the coming uh, twenty years. Uh, there's a big uh, increase in uh, industrializing of uh, houses being built that we can build houses uh, two or three days uh, on site. But the downside is that architects uh, say, okay, if we do it like this, uh, how do we deal with? Iconic houses. How do we do? Won't they all look the same? Uh, and then I come back to the Lego, uh, which I've discussed previously. Uh, um, yeah. No, uh, I, I I I know where you're. I think I know where you're going, like with the modular housing, and it's also how I ended my presentation a bit. I think that um, modular housing doesn't take away the role of the architect or um, it uh, only gets like uh, the same look and feel of buildings. I think it's actually uh, the role of the architect becomes more important to make sure that that doesn't happen and we don't get the same uh, 
like the industry zones uh, we have all across the Netherlands, uh, which are horrible to drive uh, through, as we all know, uh, yeah. then that we have to make sure that that doesn't happen with the industrialization of housing. Um, and it's actually something we are uh, working on right now with our R&D uh, department to how to make sure that we make modular houses which are affordable um, and quickly built and circular and it, it shouldn't be the, the um, it shouldn't be that's a bit weird to say it shouldn't be sustainable driven but it should the hope it's the whole housing problem which should be fixed which should be fixed yeah Thanks. And I can uh, elaborate on that. Right? I think if it's um, there's always once in a while there's uh, something happening, changing the building or like changing the world, and then say, do we need architects? All architects are are useless. Um, but I think being an architect, you have to be first of all, you have to be very uh, uh, creative, and creativity is necessary to make a change in innovation. And you, as an architect, you bring to, uh, you bring together a team, and also you keep an eye on the whole process and everything that's involved in the building. I think that the role of an architect in this this kind of um, yeah solutions and making one million houses, I think architects are quite necessary uh, in using their creativity to deal with this, to not make uh, standardized uh, housing uh, everywhere, but to bring back creativity versus this huge challenge yeah. so, uh, that's most necessary i think yeah. for, uh, for our job yeah i, I agree i agree uh, jasper um could you maybe introduce yourself um uh, quickly and then maybe you could like to uh, react good afternoon everybody i'm jasper i'm an entrepreneur and live in amsterdam uh, working in the field on the energy climate slash uh, circular field uh, focusing on the built environments uh interesting times but in my presentation when i'm on stage i say the business case the current business case the linear business case still linear it's broken and we have the ambitious to become circular so we need to change the whole system if we are still fighting with small projects to this linear system we're not going to we, 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 we're still struggling and we don't have time because our ambitions are in 10 years. The 1 million homes building new builds is in 10 years. One also, and uh, last uh, we got an, uh, an, a concrete example of the windmills placing in, in the city area in Amsterdam. There, there we, we will plant there 20 and 10 of them will come in the harbor fields. Nobody lives there, nobody uh, is against it, but 10 will be in the living area. And that is a problem. And people say, yeah, not in my backyard. And then it comes in other places. And then they say, oh, we put them in nature. And then comes the, 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 the city. Uh, the government said, no, because we want to um, also protect our nature area. And then comes in the, uh, the extra research they demand. If we talk about purchase, and we can do the same with the built environment. Uh, they say we, we need extra research. What is the impact of the, on the nature of the things we want to realize in this area? And if we do that, then we get an, a different play field when the, the whole circular will be accelerating instead of the linear one. Okay, not in my backyard, we put it in nature. Oh, there live animal. Oh, there are trees. We cut them down because we want to place these uh, uh, windmills. And that and that is that is also hard because then you get the the and also what my project uh, hits is the 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 spagat I don't know the English words between the ambitions and the and the reality and then also exists yes yeah, yes but uh, don't want to cut you short but uh, that's, it. that's it what what is the question that you'd like to ask now I also uh, know that my 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 hope. Uh, and also the question is uh, that I, I've also heard the we have the green uh, deal of uh, uh, Timmermans. And part of the green deal, green deal is a huge uh, thing. And what is the role of taxonomy? It's 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 uh, what, what what you mentioned about uh, about the 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 the, 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 the Yeah. Yeah. 
exactly that. What kind of impact will be taxonomy? It's on the construction now. It's not effective, but it's it's coming uh, on the business case because that makes it really really concrete. The business case will turn around and it will be implemented in the coming year, I think. So uh, my my I put my hope on on uh, on the green deal slash Timmermans because that speaks about we need to come up with new business cases and not fighting against the linear business case. I think, uh, let me summarize it uh, for Noor, um, a question that Jasper also put up uh, in our uh, entry form is, uh, which role will taxonomy, part of the Green Deal in the EU, play in circular purchasing? Um, are you aware of this development and do you have a, a response, Noor? Yeah, I think that it's a very good step because then uh, the taxonomy will say what is sustainable and what's not sustainable, especially what is sustainable. So there will be a more clear definition uh, on everything that can be sold or uh, put in place as sustainable and circular. So I think that can really change uh, or at least accelerate uh, the circular and, and sustainable projects. So I think it can really help. I don't think it can really change the business case. And I would rather uh, talk about value case because I think if we talk um, from a linear is business case and to a circular economy, it's about values. It's also financial, but it's more, it's, it's much broader than financial only. So we need to make the value case instead of a circular business case. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um leads me to the next question on, on circular uh, purchasing or circular, circular contracting. Uh, do you have a couple of do's or don'ts, uh, Nor, that you'd like to share on uh, circular contracting? Um, yeah, there, there are many. Um, I have a clear view on what's the purpose you want to um, focus on with purchasing. So, uh, normally uh, it's just like i want to have something new I, I need to buy something for somebody but there needs to be uh, a need behind that and i think you always has, have to ask four times the question why 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 so that's the first step so just go back into the organization or think for yourself why and then you've got the need and then a need can be the question and that can be i i want to have a new pavilion on pampas and it needs to be energy positive and also circular. And then reacting on uh, the question from Brigitte as well, the step three is about the need. What do you need? I want to have a new building. And uh, step six is about how can you measure or how do you make the criteria for the procurement process? So if you wanna have a circular building in your need, then what will be the criteria to really focus on uh, can you measure it? Um, and uh, other do's and don'ts, yeah, <laughs> it's it's pretty hard. But if um, if you work with a client or a colleague that really is stuck and fed up in the old system, uh, it's pretty hard to get it more circular because it needs a new way of thinking. And what I just told you from a business case to a value case, think what the values will be that cannot put right away to financial base. Yeah. So uh, the value is ecological. The value is in the joy of people. The value is in uh, a lot, a lot is going on on biodiversity, and we don't have the measurement financial yet. What will be the long-term result? But I think that's that's the yeah the most important thing. Can you have a long-term focus? And do you do you find people that want to uh, invest on taking the next step in that one? Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's 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 pretty soft uh, in that part. You need to have the right people around you. And, and the, yeah, the group is absolutely growing. It's, it's faster than I could believe. So please find the right people to make uh, uh, the new movement. Yeah, thanks. And uh, it also sort of uh, relates to the thing I put out there uh, before the break. Uh, often uh, it's perceived that circular procurement could lead to extra costs. Um, is is uh, is one of your solutions to sort of related to a value case, or are there any other best practices that you could share? Um, as long as uh, as people don't pay for making waste or pollution, then it can be more expensive to do the circular way. Uh, but if we have 
the opportunity to get into CO2 uh, measurements and uh, also the, the financial part of it, then it will go very fast. But at the moment, um, sometimes it is more expensive because it's, it's the small parties uh, that are uh, yeah, not yet the scale-ups, uh, just the startups. Um, and they don't have the product yet that do have all the legislation. So um, yeah, the thing is really try to focus on uh, the different layers in a building to say, okay, for the structure, I don't want to have the most innovative new product that is not uh, giving all the legislation because that's not possible. But for the installation or for the carpets, you can try new stuff and then you can really uh, organize new parties to join and, and let's see that it works. So yeah, decouple from different uh, layers in the, in the structures. Yeah, yeah. Is that also your thought, uh, Martijn, Steven? Well, uh, let's see that it works. I think that's one of the most important things. We, we can already do this. We can, be, we can build circular and we can do it within all the, all the check boxes financially, but we have to make sure that we show everybody it can be done. And I was always wondering, why aren't we going faster? I think uh, sharing this in, uh, innovative knowledge and sh showing in real cases that it's, it's a way of doing and making a better building also for people, for, for nature, for, for, uh, and also for, for uh, animal life is, uh, is uh, going to make a difference. And then other architects or other builders or, or investors see, okay, actually, yeah, we can do it. Let's do it. Yeah, and that was also actually one of the reasons why we included the Circular Landmark Works team in our, uh, in our program of Circular at Scale is that uh, we would like to tell the world that there are, uh, it's already possible and it's already happening so that people also get inspired uh, by these Circular Landmarks. Um, I touched upon the uh, split incentive for the break. Um, Nor, did you get a chance to... Uh, get your head around it? Um, I can always uh, uh, answer that question, yes. Um, yeah, I think real estate developers uh, are do have another mindset and are especially financially driven um, as you look at the circular projects. Uh, if you compare it to architects that don't have uh, the big amount of money to organize and make the circular building, then you do have a split incentive. Um, a very interesting uh, way of looking at a building is uh, the sharing layers of brand. Uh, maybe you can change the way the split incentive works to have the long-term uh, parts in a building be for a real estate developer to put his money on and that will stay for a long term. And maybe the stuff that is going around in five years or 15 years, you put the financial um, uh, delegation with the parties that can really change or use those part stuff what's going coming out again so make a change in a building and don't say the real estate is the real estate but the structure is different from the skin and the skin is different from the furniture uh, and then I think the split incentive can change yeah so yeah. I think link long term and short term and change that yeah, thanks. Interesting uh, thought. Uh, I think it needs to be uh, re researched a bit more, but uh, luckily we have Florent uh, there. So Florent is our researcher. He can uh, <laughs> provide a little bit more background on that. Thanks. Um, let me look at some more questions that came in. Uh, Birgitta, you said, uh, similar to the fair meter pilot, I was part of the Blaue Net, the circle procurement of uh, water meters. To do uh, this, we had to first get all the providers to register their product resources to make the best comparison. This slows the process immensely and the choice for a tool is a bigger challenge than expected. How can we overcome this pre-competitive stage? I think this is also for Noor, um, maybe summarizing it. Uh, and I also recognize it from my own experience is because we are at the start of this uh, transition. Sometimes we need to do a lot of extra research to be able to uh, select the right uh, uh, scale up or innovative solution or uh, partner. And that also leads to an extra amount of costs. Uh, yeah, how do you see this developing in the future? 
Yeah, I think if you have a look at the Pampas project, we did have an all new uh, process to don't let the architects uh, draw a lot amount of, of, of drawings and, and, and projects. So we just said, okay, it's three hours. Uh, tell us, how do you think about the project? You definitely, you prepare something, but it's not a, a more a large amount of time and products that you need to make. Uh, but it, the selection was pretty qualitative. So I don't think that with the uh, meter project, you can do that because it's in everybody's home. Uh, it needs to be really legislated and everything is in there. But with the fair meter project, um, we did have the pre-selection shortened because we say we do have an in innovative partnership for a year with two parties to really make the design. So then you can shorten the pre-phase but you longer the cooperation phase with the two partners to get to the, pro yeah, the product you want to have. So, but then you only have two partners and you don't have all the parties that need to be selected. So I think the change we have to make that we do have qualitative, qualitative aspects in the selection to put the quantitative aspects later on in the process and say, okay, you didn't cross the bridge for this quantitative, you get out. So there yeah. will be a partnership. Yeah, yeah. It, it's actually some uh, very much something that we try to do, but we uh, um, this was a, a large procurement of water mains. So a very normal, it's not a pilot or like a fair meter or a, it was a, a, a normal thing that we procured um, many, many plastic pipes. Um, and uh, uh, so we had to comply with uh, European uh, procurement guidelines. So it had to go through a normal comparison and open um, bidding process. So instead, what we did was this research up front to gather all the data and got all the, all the uh, suppliers involved and all the water companies as well. Um, yeah, I mean, there's there's no other way. I think that was the <laughs> the only way. Uh, but gathering the data is another uh, challenge. I feel because not all suppliers want to literally, you know, just give all their data away. So it's it's uh, it's a challenge. Yeah. Okay. But thanks. Yeah, it's 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 nice to hear more about the spare meter. Cool. Yeah. Um, uh... Final question to you, uh, Nor, is uh, what do you consider to be the biggest hurdle or the biggest barrier preventing certain procurement from taking off? The mindset of people. We're so absolutely fond of doing things. We know what the result will be because we then can cross or just think it off and say, okay, I've done my job and I'm, I'm ready. Uh, and I think circular procurement is a whole new way of thinking and you don't know exactly what you get because that is the coolest part of it you're changing and you're making something new. Uh, but that's really hard for people, especially for a lot of male people in high in companies that say, okay, I have my targets. I have all my boxes that I need to tick. And I think if we can just move out of the boxes, then we can really change the system. But we're so, yeah, closed up in all the boxes. And how, so, how are we going to uh, achieve this, Nor? Find the right people and um, just do it. I mean, that's what Steve and Martijn also say. Um, yeah, just let show show everybody that it works. I mean, I've been working on circular procurement for 12 years. We did really cool projects. You can do it. Everybody can do it. Yeah, it's already possible and it's already been done, so. Yeah. All right, with that inspiring uh, closing remark, uh, I dare anybody to ask another question. No, I think we had a very uh, uh, inspiring session. Uh, thanks for the presentation of Martijn, Steve, and, and Noor, and the discussion and the questions that were asked. Um, yeah, I'd like to close off and thank the organization, Mara and Marije, and uh, see you at the next Circle at Skill Talks uh, or at some other session. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much.